from around the globe. In sold out arenas and humble churches. From out on the streets. To your screen. And now, the time and what must be done. On this edition of Farrakhan Speaks. Greetings to you. I am Minister Louis Farrakhan, National Representative of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, that great preacher of freedom, justice, and equality to the black man and woman of America and the Western Hemisphere, and to the Aboriginal people of the earth, the eternal leader of the nation of Islam, and a warner to the government and people of the United States of America, and a warner to the nations of the earth. Continuing with our discussion on this shadow government that keeps critical information away from elected presidents, there have been several American presidents who have commented on this secret shadow government. According to an article by Ross Pittman posted on the website ConsciousLifeNews.com titled Verified Warnings from Former U.S. Presidents About the Invisible Government Running the United States with No Allegiance to the People. He identifies certain presidents who mentioned the shadow government. In Mr. Pittman's article, he states that George Washington, the first president of the United States, wrote that the Illuminati want to separate the people from their government. Quote, It was not my intention to doubt that the doctrines of the Illuminati and principles of Jacobinism had not spread in the United States. On the contrary, no one is more truly satisfied of this fact than I am. The idea that I meant to convey was that I did not believe that the lodges of Freemasons in this country had as societies endeavored to propagate the diabolical tenets of the first or Illuminati or the pernicious principles of the latter, the Jacobins, if they are susceptible of separation, that individuals of them may actually have a separation of the people from their government in view is too evident to be questioned. George Washington goes on to say that the Illuminati as a group of highly intelligent, enlightened persons who wanted to separate the people from their government and their government from the people, but he never broke down who these Illuminati were. According to Wikipedia, Vernon Stauffer, who wrote a dissertation entitled New England and the Bavarian Illuminati, published by New York Columbia University Press in 1918, indicates that Bavarian philosopher Adam Weishaupt is credited as the founder of the Bavarian Illuminati, May 1st, 1776. Historically, the name refers to an Enlightenment era secret society. In subsequent use, 
Illuminati refers to various organizations claiming or purported to have unsubstantiated links to the original Bavarian Illuminati or similar secret societies and often alleged to conspire to control world affairs by masterminding events and planting agents in government and corporations to establish a new world order and gain further political power and influence. Central to some of the most widely known and elaborate conspiracy theories, the Illuminati have been depicted as lurking in the shadows and pulling the strings and levers of power in dozens of novels, movies, television shows, comics, video games, and music videos. Jacobinism is described as the practice of the Jacobins, a political group advocating egalitarian democracy during the French Revolution. The ideology of the most radical element of the French Revolution that instituted the reign of terror. Although Jews of France in particular, the Sephardic Jews of Paris were considered as Jacobins. It referred more specifically to Jews and the non-Jews who supported them. Depending on the historical writers, despite who controlled the press, both groups were charged with initiating the French Revolution. Thomas Jefferson, the third president, was much more specific about the shadow government. He said, quote, I sincerely believe with you that banking establishments are more dangerous than standing armies, close quote. John C. Calhoun, vice president of the United States under the seventh president, Andrew Jackson said, a power has risen up in the government greater than the people themselves, consisting of many and various and powerful interests combined into one mass and held together by the cohesive power of the vast surplus in the banks. This mighty combination will be opposed to any change and it is to be feared. Such is its influence, no measure to which it is opposed can become a law, however expedient and necessary, and that the public money will remain in their possession to be disposed of not as the public interest but as theirs may dictate. The time indeed seems fast approaching when no law can pass, nor any honor be conferred from the chief magistrate to the tied waiter without the assent of this powerful and interested combination which is steadily becoming the government itself to the utter subversion of the authority of the people. Nay, I fear we are in the midst of it, and I look with anxiety to the fate of this measure as the test whether we are or not. Theodore Roosevelt the 26th president of the United States said, quote, 
behind the ostensible government sits enthroned an invisible government owing no allegiance and acknowledging no responsibility to the people. To destroy this invisible government, to befoul the unholy alliance between corrupt business and corrupt politics is the first task of the statesmanship of the day. Close quote. Woodrow Wilson, the 28th President of the United States, said, quote, A great industrial nation is controlled by its system of credit. Our system of credit is privately concentrated. The growth of the nation, therefore, and all our activities are in the hands of a few men. We have come to be one of the worst ruled, one of the most completely controlled and dominated governments in the civilized world, no longer a government by free opinion, no longer a government by conviction and the vote of the majority, but a government by the opinion and the duress of small groups of dominant men. Since I entered politics, I have chiefly had men's views confided to me privately. Some of the biggest men in the United States in the field of commerce and manufacture are afraid of somebody, are afraid of something. They know that there's a power somewhere so organized, so subtle, so watchful, so interlocked, so complete, so pervasive that they had better not speak above their breath when they speak in condemnation of it. By the way, this was said in the early 1900s when a small group of Jews and some Gentiles on Jekyll Island off the coast of Georgia conspired to take over the printing of money and banknotes for America. And this was done December 23rd, 1913. That is when the bankers of Europe took over the banking institution of America called the Federal Reserve. Franklin Delano Roosevelt, the 32nd president of the United States, said about this shadow government, quote, the real truth of the matter is, as you and I know, that a financial element in the large centers has owned the government ever since the days of Andrew Jackson. Close quote. John F. Kennedy, the 35th president of the United States, warning of the shadow government said, quote, The very word secrecy is repugnant in a free and open society, and we are as a people inherently and historically opposed to secret societies, to secret oaths, and to secret proceedings. Our way of life is under attack. Those who make themselves our enemy are advancing around the globe. No war ever posed a greater threat to our security. If you are awaiting a finding of clear and present danger, then I can only say that the danger has never been more clear and its presence 
has never been more imminent. For we are opposed around the world by a monolithic and ruthless conspiracy that relies primarily on covert means for expanding its sphere of influence, on infiltration instead of invasion, on subversion instead of elections, on intimidation instead of free choice, on guerrillas by night instead of armies by day. It is a system which has conscripted vast human and material resources into the building of a tightly knit, highly efficient machine that combines military, diplomatic, intelligence, economic, scientific, and political operations. Its preparations are concealed, not published. Its mistakes are buried, not headlined. Its dissenters are silenced, not praised. And no expenditure is questioned. No rumor is printed. No secret is revealed. Close quote. Such are the statements of presidents from George Washington to John Fitzgerald Kennedy. Although these men pointed to a secretive, shadowy government, the one thing that they failed to do was to tell us who were the members of this covert group that had gained power. The Federal Reserve, the international bankers, the industrialists, who were these people? So since they would not expose them. John the Revelator in the scriptures of the Bible does expose them. In the second chapter of Revelations, the ninth verse in the King James Version, it reads, quote, I know thy works and tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. And I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Close quote. And I respectfully say that any person who calls himself or herself a Jew and agrees with those who claim to be Jews who are going against the teachings that Almighty God sent down to them through the prophets, they are not Jews, and their claiming to be Jews is blasphemy. But you claim to have a covenant relationship with the God of righteousness. Well, what is a covenant? In the theological definition of the word, it is defined as, quote, an agreement that brings about a relationship in commitment between God and his people. The Jewish faith is built on the biblical covenants made with Abraham, Moses, and David. Let's stop right there. Abraham, you that are befouling the atmosphere with filth and degeneracy, you can't connect yourself to Abraham, who is considered the father of monotheistic belief, who was obedient to God in all that God had commanded him to do. You cannot say that you have a covenant through Moses who gave you a law that you are flaunting today with what you are doing through Hollywood, through music, through the media, through the press, through the newspapers, through your inordinate control of the means by which the people think and make their decisions. David 
even though he may have made a mistake, he submitted and repented before God. This you false Jews have not done. No, you are not a Jew. I say you are so-called Jew. You are Satan masquerading as a covenanted people of God. You must be exposed regardless to the consequences. This is why in the New Testament, in the book of John, the eighth chapter, when those satanic Jews under the name scribes and Pharisees claimed Abraham as their father, Jesus rebuked them. They said in verse 39, they answered and said unto Jesus, Abraham is our father. And Jesus said unto them, if you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. And Jesus also tells them in verse 40, but now you seek to kill me, a man that hath told you the truth which I have heard of God. This did not Abraham. Jesus tells them they do the deeds of their father. And then these satanic Jews claim God as their father in verse 41. And Jesus answered, you do the deeds of your father. Then said they to him, we be not born of fornication. We have one father, even God. And Jesus responds in verses 42 to 44. He said unto them, if God were your father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God Neither came I of myself, but he sent me. Why do you not understand my speech? Even because you cannot hear my word. You are of your father, the devil, and the lusts of your father you shall do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own for he's a liar and the father of it. As I have said in my Savior's Day message in February 2012, the synagogue of Satan is not just composed of so-called Jews, it's composed of people of like minds that are under their influence. They have broken their covenant with God and are no longer the people of God except that they are the people of the God of this world, which is Satan himself. They certainly are not the people of the God of righteousness. So you weak people, you weak preachers, you weak government officials who refuse to say that it is the synagogue of Satan, so-called Jews in their blasphemy, to say that they have a covenant relationship with God when it is the very thing that they are promoting that's bringing the moral standard of America down into the mud. And this is why the scriptures say that we have to put on the whole armor of God. As I said in episode 56 of the time and what must be done. Why would we need the whole armor of God? It's because we can't stand unless we know that the man of sin has been revealed, the son of perdition who's leading America to ruin. And you all are witnessing the ruin of this nation and you are too weak to speak the truth 
that reveals this man of sin, this son of perdition. But I represent the two who have come to end the civilization of these so-called Jews of the synagogue of Satan. But I want the world to know the righteous Jews who follow the law that has been sent down to them through the prophets that were sent to the Israelites will have their place in a righteous kingdom, but not these unfaithful masqueraders of the synagogue of Satan. But despite the actions of this shadow government to suppress the knowledge of the existence of the wheel, Allah God is manifesting an aspect of his presence through the wheel. On pages 383 and 384 of Above Top Secret, the worldwide UFO cover-up, author Timothy Good discusses a report of astronauts on Apollo 11 encountering UFOs on the moon. He writes, quote, according to hitherto unconfirmed reports, both Neil Armstrong and Edwin Buzz Aldrin saw UFOs shortly after that historic landing on the moon in Apollo 11 on the 21st of July, 1969. According to former NASA employee Otto Binder, unnamed radio hams with their own VHF receiving facilities that bypassed NASA's broadcasting outlets picked up the following exchange. Mission Control, what's there? Mission Control calling Apollo 11. Apollo 11, these babies are huge, sir. Enormous. Oh, God, you wouldn't believe it. I'm telling you, there are other spacecraft out there lined up on the far side of the crater edge. They're on the moon watching us. The story has been relegated to the world of science fiction since it first appeared. But in 1979, Maurice Chatelaine, former chief of NASA communications specialists, and one of the scientists who conceived and designed the Apollo spacecraft confirmed that Armstrong had indeed reported seeing two UFOs on the rim of a crater. The encounter was common knowledge in NASA, he revealed, but nobody has talked about it until now. Close quote. During the citizens' hearing on disclosure in Washington, D.C., there was a presentation of a video interview of March the 5th, 2013, of an anonymous military U.S. Army soldier who later began working for the CIA. This interview shows this person speaking on President Eisenhower threatening to invade Area 51. Let's take a look at a video excerpt of that interview. Yes, well, as we get older and older, I'm 77 right now. You can't live forever, you know. So if this uh, um, procedure I'm going to have to clean the blood doesn't work, then I've got 
probably a few more months to make it before my kidneys shut down, you know. So that's kind of why I'm kind of going along with the interview at this time. You're seeing that what you went through is just too important for people not to know about. Yeah. Yeah. C can you just, let, can we start at the beginning with your military career and just walk through what exactly your experiences were? I was in the, drafted into the military and got into the U.S. Army. After that, I was sent to the Signal Training Center in eastern United States. What year would this be? 58. I went through the Signal Training course. And at that time, I went through the radio teletype course and also the cryptography course, crypto. They had five instructors that were getting out of military service. So they pulled the top five students and I was third in the class. So I got pulled as an instructor. Now were you at this time also working yet for CIA? No. Not yet? No. After one day, my boss came to me, and he uh, said, uh, how would you like to, you know, make some extra money? And I said, oh, money is good. <laughs> <laughs> so he explained to me that I could, he could put it through. I would have to get a top secret White House Q clearance for the job, you know. And I thought, boy, must be a pretty exclusive thing, you know. And I said, well, what is this? And he said that I'm director for the CIA for Eastern United States, you know. And I said, oh, I didn't know that. And he said, you weren't supposed to. <laughs> <laughs> After about six weeks, my security clearance came through and I got my CIA card. It was an ID card, like a credit card, where I could just go up to the door and slice it, walk right in. And my uh, name at that time, I used a mm -hmm. artificial name too. Never used my real name. I started working with him on the project he was on. And that was... Uh, Project Blue Book, which was kind of partially a fraud. And then the other thing is, of course, you really weren't able to tell family or, or close no, friends, obviously. No, I, I couldn't tell anybody. In fact, I, I had to take a vow that I wouldn't tell anybody. A lot of it for 40 years and more of it for 50 years, which is up in... 2010. So my boss came to me and he says, we've both got a new assignment. And he says, oh, I said, where are we going? Oh, he says, we're going to the Capitol. We're going to be part of the Eisenhower push. He's trying to find out something about, all about these aliens, that MJ-12 was supposed to find out, but never did, never sent back reports to him. The MJ-12, the UFO you, control group, were they calling it MJ-12 yes, at that time? Yes. yes. They called us in, went into the Oval Office, and Eisen, President Eisenhower was there and Nixon, and they said, uh, we called the people in from MJ-12 from Area 51 and S-4, but uh, they told us that the government had no jurisdiction over what they were doing. So being a general, past general, you didn't tell them to go to hell without any <laughs> real good reason, you know. Mm -hmm. So he said, uh, I want you and 
your boss to fly out there. I want you to give him a personal message. He says, I want you to tell them, whoever is in charge, tell them that to get in, they have this week, coming week, to get into Washington and to report to me. And if they don't, I'm going to get the first army from Colorado and we're going to go over, we're going to take the base over. I don't care what kind of classified material you got. We're going to rip this thing apart. Eisenhower was going to invade yes, Area, Area 51. 51. Yeah, with the first army. So you go out with your superior. Yes. You fly out. You land. What happens? Can you describe this whole process? What you saw? It took us the 13 or 15 miles south to S4. And like different garage door openings. Okay. And in these garage door openings, they had like different saucer crafts. The very first one had uh, the uh, Roswell craft in. It was kind of crashed up, but apparently every alien that was in it died except for a couple. So you see the Roswell craft, and what are some of the others that you see? Well, the Roswell craft was really strange because it looked like real heavy. Aluminum foil. <laughs> we could rock next to it, and you could rock it. The whole thing probably weighed 150, 300 pounds. Now, why were they bringing you out here at all, anyway, to see an alien? What was the point? To go back and tell the president they actually had one. So he did not know at this point no. if there was an alien no. at S4? No. What did you do then at Area? Were you done or did you have other things to do? Yeah, so basically we were kind of done, went back to Area 51. Mm -hmm. They took us into the main building and there we saw a U-2, which of course we didn't know existed. Mm -hmm. And the, uh, a model of the SR-71. Yeah, the Blackbird. We flew back to, to uh, the commuter plane, back to the air base, mm -hmm. and then took President Eisenhower's Lockheed Electra back to Washington. You and your supervisor, yeah. superior officer, and now you're meeting with the president? Yes. Can you describe this? Well, we met with him in... Uh, Boy, the second story of the, the old OSS warehouse building. And uh, Eisenhower and Nixon were there. And uh, also Hoover was there. So he asked us what was going on. And we told him about the alien the whole situation. And the... Uh, black projects and so on, and he was just totally shocked. He appeared for the first time to be worried, mm -hmm. you know, like he was worried. Surprised about the black programs. Eisenhower said, got to keep this thing completely secret, mm -hmm. you know, can't talk about this. Your actual name is... I mean, the name you grew up with, that I was a different name than what yes, you had in the... I never, never the used it in the CIA at all. Now, what about today? You're going on the public record, and this is still sensitive information, even though earlier you talked about, you know, security oaths that maybe expire after a certain period of time. Fifty years. But you're still concerned. Linda Moulton's phone call... Her phone was tapped, and they got my f phone number, and through the telephone company, they were able to find me, and so on. When they found you, what happened? I was going to a grocery store. Two guys in a black suits 
come out of a black Lincoln town car and came over to see me. Mm-hmm. And he told me that I'd better not publish anything or talk to Linda about any more things. So at that time, I did, you know, I did, I stopped. That was enough to intimidate you? Yes. Rather remain anonymous. Never show my face on anything. Really, thank you for doing this. Yes. This was, I guess, kind of a good idea because I feel much better having talked about it. I kind of feel like there's a load off my shoulders. Really? Because uh, I had an awful lot of secrets that I had kept over the years. I think the testimony of this man who says he's facing death can be considered as similar to a dying declaration in the legal arena, which is, according to a legal dictionary, quote, a statement by a person who is conscious and knows that death is imminent concerning what he or she believes to be the cause or circumstances of death that can be introduced into evidence during a trial in certain cases. A dying declaration is considered credible and trustworthy evidence based upon the general belief that most people who know that they are about to die do not lie. Now, I really don't know if anything exists in Roswell, Area 51, out in New Mexico. But if something is there, they are saying that certain wheels crashed. I know that no wheel crashed. But if you have a wheel, it is a gift from the beneficent God to show you more conclusively that he is present and what you could achieve if you submitted. He, the master of the wheels, would teach you. So he sent you a sign. That's all it is. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad said, These wheels were made with the finest steel. You've been trying to get all your metallurgists to try to figure out how the steel that's on the wheel was made. And oh, look, there's so much for you to learn. What is a metallurgist? A metallurgist is a person who practices or specializes in the field of metallurgy. Metallurgy is the technique or science of working or heating metals so as to give them certain desired properties. It's the technique or science of making and compounding alloys. It's the technique or science of separating metals from their ores. A declassified FBI document dated March 22, 1950 from the special agent in charge in Washington, D.C., Guy Hottel, to the FBI director, J. Edgar Hoover, concerning the Roswell incident. It reads, subject, flying saucers information concerning these flying saucers. The following information was furnished to a special agent whose name was redacted. An investigator for the Air Force stated that three so-called flying saucers 
had been recovered in New Mexico. They were described as being circular in shape with raised centers approximately 50 feet in diameter. Each one was occupied by three bodies of human shape, but only three feet tall, dressed in metallic cloth of a very fine texture. Each body was bandaged in a manner similar to the blackout suits used by speed flyers and test pilots. According to the person, the informant, the sources were found in New Mexico due to the fact that the government has a very high-powered radar set up in that area, and it is believed the radar interferes with the controlling mechanism of the saucers. No further evaluation was attempted by the special agent concerning the above. Close quote. The man in this memo is describing three discs, circular in shape with raised centers approximately 50 feet in diameter. He didn't say they look crashed up. The most honorable Elijah Muhammad stated in an article he wrote, quote, You may wish, Mr. Enemy, that you could get a shot at the wheel with your jet planes and other military weapons. But you should just go home and go to sleep. No one can harm this plane, the wheel. They're going to fix you up first before the wheel ever comes into sight. You cannot live on the moon only just so long as your oxygen and hydrogen last you. The moon is about the closest platform that I know of that you could possibly try to use. Venus and Mars. You cannot use Venus and Mars. The people on Mars will not let you land on Mars. And if they do let you land on Mars, they would be silly to do so. You would like to see what the people on Mars look like. That is not, say, impossible. Oh, wheel. The greatest mechanical defender, powered by the spirit of Allah to protect us, the black people on the face of the earth. So now you say that there's life on Mars as if it's some great discovery of your scientists. Not only did Master Farad Muhammad teach the Honorable Elijah Muhammad of the people on Mars, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad said that Master Farad Muhammad pictured and extracted the language of the people on Mars. He said they live 1,200 of our earth years and they are from seven to nine feet tall. But the Honorable Elijah Muhammad went on so far as to say, if they do let you land on Mars, they would be silly to do so. Everything the Honorable Elijah Muhammad taught, he taught with authority. And you have yet to disprove anything that he taught in the 44 years that he was among us. Do you think that now, after 83 years of the existence of the nation of Islam, and you have still been unable to disprove anything of what the Honorable Elijah Muhammad said, that the world should now know what you have kept secret of the reality of the wheel, that great mother plane? There's nothing for the people to lose, but there are their lives to gain. 
He is sending you knowledge. Our wheels don't crash. He's sending you knowledge and giving you time to acclimate yourself to the knowledge and through the power of that knowledge to increase your skill, which it already has done. You never knew anything about cracking atoms until you took the wisdom out of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad's home, the problem book, the mathematical writings of Master Farad Muhammad in mathematical language, when you took that knowledge, you put it before your scientists. And your scientists then told you that this man is more than what you thought. And the government of the United States, the FBI, has exhausted and spent millions of dollars trying to find him. That is Master Farad Muhammad, and you concluded after years and millions of dollars that you could not find him. And you said the search ended. He's on the wheel above your head, and he is wherever he desires to be. It is the knowledge that we possess from the great Mahdi, Master Farad Muhammad, and his great Messiah that reveals your hidden secrets. And this is what intensifies your desire to attack the nation of Islam. But if you come after us, or rather when you try to come after us, this provokes the wheels. Because the Honorable Elijah Muhammad was asked in an interview, when will these wheels go into action? And he replied, when you attack us. So the Honorable Elijah Muhammad said, if we follow him, you don't need weapons. And if you follow me, I will lead you into, in other words, these are the words of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, the full protection of the arms that are yours, which, of course, are the wheels. He wants to take out of us as a people the fear of the enemy and his weapons. So it's necessary for us to say to America, Russia, China, India, Pakistan, Israel, England, and France, all of the nuclear powers that you have absolutely nothing that can protect you or your people from the destructive power of the mother plane or that great wheel. There's nothing that you can do with the wheel because you've tried that. It can tear up your civilization with just a sound coming from the wheel. You don't have any nuclear facility that you can push a button that is not known by the scientists that are on the wheel. And while you're thinking about pushing the button in between your finger and the button is God himself, the Christ, the great. Mahdi, it's wise for you to do like the Muslims do in their prayer service. Throw up your hands and say, Allahu Akbar, God is the greatest. And if you do that, you can save your life. The Pharaoh that was before you fought God. He thought maybe he could win, but when his army was drowning in the Red Sea, he bore witness that there is no God but Allah. So Allah saved his body for you to look at. He saved his body but killed him to give you a chance to know that what happened to Pharaoh can happen to you. You, however, having that history in front of you can avoid that consequence and live. 
this is what Allah God is offering you. He's offering you your life or an extension of your time. But you have to submit. And why shouldn't you? Now to the common Caucasian. I know this is heartbreaking to hear that something is above your head that can destroy you in the twinkling of an eye. I understand. But I'm just here to tell you that there is a chance for you. But that shadow government, your leaders who are influenced by the synagogue of Satan has this in their mind. If I'm going down, I'll take the whole world down with me. Wrong, Satan. You can't contend with God and win. You are going down. It is written that Allah sits in the heavens and laughs, for he will have you in derision. What is derision? Derision is a noun that means ridicule, mockery. He's going to make you an object of ridicule. Maybe this is why the late Mr. Edgar Bronfman, multi-billionaire, powerful member of the Jewish community and former president of the World Jewish Congress, whom I met with in his penthouse apartment. In the meeting was Mike Wallace of 60 Minutes, Brother Rock Newman, boxing promoter and manager of former heavyweight champion Riddick Bowe, who helped Mike Wallace to arrange the meeting, my wife Khadija, my son Mustafa Farrakhan, my former chief of staff Leonard Farrakhan Mohammed, and the supreme captain at that time, Brother Abdul Sharif Muhammad. During the conversation, Rock Newman raised the question of Mr. Bronfman's helping with money to aid a redevelopment of the Howard Inn Hotel in Washington, D.C. And when the question of money was raised, I rebuked Rock Newman and said that the problems between blacks and Jews are too serious to put a band-aid on it with some money. After a dinner meeting which lasted approximately four hours, Mr. Bronfman during that time couldn't make me bow down to his power his influence, or money. So in a later interview, Mr. Bronfman referred to me as the personification of evil who only wanted money. Again, the devil is a liar because anything or anyone that represents the two who are present to end the civilization of the Jews is absolutely evil to them. That is why they have called me the devil. Mayor Koch of New York referred to me as the devil. Some rabbis have called me a devil and even have referred to me as a new black Hitler. I can understand that. The wicked know that a new age is coming, but they don't really know what it is and they know they won't be in it. They're listening and they're getting more terrified. Your days of lying wonders are over. The truth is here. So by the time 
Surely man is in loss except those who believe and do good and enjoin one another to truth and enjoin one another to patience. Now the question has always been when the election of a president takes place, is he the one that will be able to save America from what the prophets have predicted? And if what is above top secret, the knowledge of which will allow him to make a correct and informed decision, then the presidents have been locked out of that, which is in the best interest of the American people and the future of this nation and the future of the nations of the earth. Once these wicked knew the wheel was present, the whole constitutionality of government began to be interrupted. Now in the Government Accountability Office should be a record of all public money that is spent so that there is constitutionally a level of transparency. But the moment a black budget is set up that no one can question, then you start shredding the Constitution. This is why today the Constitution to many is of no value, for those in power do with it what they please, and they do against it what they please, and in so doing, they are destroying the very fabric that has kept this nation together. Now, Every nation, even God, has secrets. But when Allah, God, has a secret that he hides from everyone, he hides it. So that at the appropriate time to accomplish the greatest good, he reveals his secrets. So we can't fault a government for holding secrets. That's not what this is about but holding secrets from the highest elected officials elected by the majority vote of the American people is disallowing that person whom the American people have elected the right to make definitive decisions for the well-being and security of the American people. That knowledge is in the hands of a group that is very small and tight-knit. And there's a code among them. Any of them who break that secret, they are killed outright. And a lot of deaths have been going on from people who approach the knowledge of the secrets and were willing to expose the secret to the American people. It's critical because these are the things that when exposed could possibly lead to revolution because a small group knows and hides it from even lawmaking bodies. And even in the Senate where you have committees that are called intelligence committees that deals with intelligence matters, yet even they are locked out. So then this small group can manipulate the president like it was done when the neoconservatives wanted to go to war in Iraq. They manipulated intelligence because above the intelligence agencies of the government is the secret government. There's a wheel up there in the sky that is the manifestation of the presence of Almighty God, Allah. And he is offering you a way 
to save yourselves extend your time and it's opening up secrets that would allow you to perfect the things that you already know that is good for the american people and it's good for the people of the earth but if that is not congruent with the wishes of the few in the shadow government then as we have said they will use money to confuse the american people by their control of the media in putting stories and articles in the paper to feed the american public lies that hide the truth cover the truth yet allah god says in both the bible and holy quran even though it is the weight of an atom hidden in a rock and the rock is buried in the heart of the earth yet will allah bring it forth so we live in that day when the truth is going to be made known and the liars and those who have hidden the truth from the people will be cast down by the people as they rise against their governments my brother President Barack Obama, the Clintons are your friends. Did they tell you what Lawrence Rockefeller showed them about these so-called unidentified flying objects? Did they tell you about that, Brother Barack? If they didn't and they know Ask yourself, why not? Why didn't they tell you? Here's what we think. We would like to free all of the American people and the people of the various nations of the earth that have seen these so-called unidentified flying objects and have been silenced because they were threatened either with death or they were made to think or to look like they were crazy. Scientists, scholars, decent Americans, patriots were made to shut up and take the secrets of the wheel that they have seen to their graves. But after we finish this lecture, we would pray that all of you would come out of hiding and stand up on what you know and then go and shout it from the rooftops. Why? Because we want to open up Roswell. As we have said, none of these wheels crashed. We don't have any crashing wheels, so stop saying that some of your radar interfered with the wheels and that's why they crashed. If that radar was so strong, why haven't you brought down all 1,500 and the mother wheel as well? You're just lying. You got a gift from God. He allowed these wheels to come to you so that you could go in and see what is in there. But you have been so afraid to share this wonderful gift with the scientists of the world because you want to maintain your supremacy over them. If God is present, and he is, then your days of supremacy are over. Almighty God, Allah has given you this gift of wheels if you have them at Roswell 57 or 51, pardon me. 
he's given you america this gift because you are number one to be destroyed because of your evil done to his people the real children of israel the black man and woman of america he gave you this gift but in giving it to you through this he'll make himself known remember pharaoh god raised him up so that he who was not known could be made known through Pharaoh. If Pharaoh submitted, God would be made known. But when Pharaoh rebelled and God destroyed him, God still was made known. America, you are the king of the hill. All the nations fear your great power. And that's what makes it even more difficult for you to submit. But in any case, God is present and he raised you up and made you the greatest nation on earth that through you, the world that did not know him might come to know him, believe in him and submit to him. Thus, the beginning of a brand new world would come into existence. Brother President Barack, I believe that you really want peace. You won't make peace with Israel and the Palestinians. That's not going to happen. If Iran did have a nuclear bomb, you would have more of a chance of having peace because then Israel would have to come to real terms for peace other than the terms that she offers for peace backed by her inordinate power in that region. My dear brother Palestinians, You're in a losing cause. How can you say that you want a two-state solution and you have no real sovereignty over what you possess or over your own space or the space you're hoping to get? The Israelis are not going to allow you to have weapons to defend your part of the territory. They want to be the master. So those are the terms. They're not going to allow Palestinians to return to their former places of abode. These are not terms for peace. These are terms for a false settlement that will allow the Israelis to continue their mastery over the Palestinian people. In an article from the Honorable Elijah Muhammad in the Pittsburgh Courier, in a series of articles he called The Analysis of the Wheel from the Book of Ezekiel, he wrote, according to the history of the white race, they are guilty of making trouble causing war among the people and themselves ever since they have been on our planet Earth. So the God of the righteous has found them disagreeable to live with in peace and has decided to remove them from the face of the Earth. God does not have to tell us that they are disagreeable to live with in peace we already know it, for we are the victims of these troublemakers. Allah will fight this war for the sake of his people, the black people, the real children of Israel, and especially 
for the American so-called Negroes. As I have said, Elijah Muhammad writing, time and again, we, the so-called American Negroes, will be the lucky ones. We are Allah's choice to give life, and we will be put on top of civilization. So peace can only come from a superior power, and I represent that power. I am your last chance and I am issuing the final call. Believe it or not, I am the true vicegerent of the Mahdi or the Christ, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. And now I say to the Pope, and all the lovers of Jesus. If you desire, let's have a showdown. You call the Jesus that you know, and I'll call on the Jesus that I know, and let's see which one of us really knows Jesus. Yes, there's 1,500 of these wheels. I believe in Jesus. I believe him to be the Christ. And we have all over the world a right to love Jesus. But it's better to love him with knowledge than to love him in the way that he is being represented. All of you Baal prophets and hypocrites, join all together, all of you that condemn me. See if you have the power, all of you together, to call the Christ the master of the wheel and let him bring them down, all 1,500 of them. You go ahead and tried to call the wheels down. Since Jesus is up there and he's the master of that wheel. And I'll make a call to the Jesus that I know and represent. And let's see which one of us he'll answer. Remember the showdown? between Elijah and the Baal prophets and how Elijah brought down fire from heaven? Well, if we call, they'll bring down fire from heaven. Now be careful because when the showdown came, and the Baal prophets did not prevail. Elijah killed every single one of them. So please, please be careful of the evil that you are planning against us. These 1500 wheels were seen in Mexico. Let's see the video clip of these 1500 wheels. Recientemente se han presentado en los alrededores de la Ciudad de México y en la propia ciudad las llamadas flotillas, estos objetos voladores no identificados. En muchas ocasiones se acercan peligrosamente a las aeronaves. Vea usted la investigación que nos ha preparado Johanan Díaz es de tomarse en cuenta. En las últimas semanas en la República Mexicana han sido videograbados diversas flotillas OVNI que contienen más de 1500 objetos voladores no identificados y que a lo largo de la siguiente cápsula le presentaré a usted los casos más recientes. Acompáñenos en esta cápsula. 
Cerca de 1.500 objetos voladores no identificados fueron observados sobre el Distrito Federal el pasado 3 de noviembre a las 8 de la mañana con 25 minutos. Eran objetos de apariencia esférica y color blanco detectados en la Colonia del Valle con dirección a la Jusco. En primera instancia se observaban como una masa difusa lo que llamó la atención del vigilante del cielo, Arturo Robles Gil, quien en entrevista con Tercer Milenio aseguró que inmediatamente tomó su cámara de video para grabarlos. A través de la observación, este sí estaba muy lejos de esa flotilla, vi una mancha difusa, veo una mancha difusa que me llama la atención sin saber de qué se trataba y solamente a través del alcance que tiene la cámara, en este caso que fueron 100 aumentos, me percato de que era una enorme flotilla de esferas. El Casa OVNI afirmó que la grabación de esta flotilla duró cerca de cinco minutos, la cual realizó con una potencia de zoom cercana a los 100 aumentos y que los describe como esféricos y color blanco. Objetos esféricos, todos, blancos, estáticos, que iban en grupo, circulando, circulando hacia los volcanes y se, y se fueron... Al abrir yo la toma, porque no, no es que los haya yo perdido, al abrir yo la toma para referenciar la ubicación de los mismos y, y tratarlos de reubicar ya no pude por la distancia a la que se encontraba. Robles Gil mencionó que durante el avistamiento pudo observar a dos objetos más grandes que los demás que parecían ser los guías. Haciendo revisión cuadro por cuadro se ve ahí dos objetos de mayor tamaño y de diferente forma que probablemente podrían ser los que estuvieran controlando o interactuando con este, con este enorme conglomerado. Y aquí cabe mencionar que es obviamente uno de los más grandes que se haya filmado en la Ciudad de México. Días antes, el 26 de octubre, el joven Jaciel Sánchez, en la zona de Chapultepec, también en la Ciudad de México, tomó diversas fotografías donde se observaban a decenas de ovnis que a decir del testigo eran esferas plateadas. Sin embargo, aseguró nuestro entrevistado que su mamá fue la primer persona en percatarse de este avistamiento. Que mi mamá eh, estaba haciendo el quehacer en la casa y eh, volteó, como tenemos un patio, volteó hacia el cielo y vio una esfera. Había como cinco reunidas al principio. Y después ya a lo lejos, después de unos 10, 15 minutos, vimos a lo lejos una masa totalmente casi blanca porque había tantas esferas, yo había cientos, yo considero que no las podía contar así a simple vista. Sánchez nos describió el comportamiento de estos objetos anómalos sobre el poniente de la Ciudad de México. Para el presente todas estaban siguiendo a una sola y esa esfera es la que lideraba a todas y se eh, movían entre unas y otras. Eh, llegábamos a ver este, tres esferas que se juntaban y entre ellas hacían movimientos sobre una misma y formaban, unas, formaban un color rojo entre, en medio de ellas. Jaciel aseguró que su familia pudo observar este fenómeno desde las 9 de la mañana hasta las 10.30 y que no correspondía a globos soltados en el bosque de Chapultepec, ya que su comportamiento es muy distinto. Hay una esfera que le esté liderando, si ese globo puede ser una que todas atrás les puedan seguir, yo diría, pues es una tecnología que al menos yo creo que está dando inicios. No lo pensé así porque yo sé que no hay tecnología todavía así que siga una masa, por lo, por lo, por lo menos en toda mi vida yo no lo he visto así. Como se han podido dar cuenta, la manifestación de objetos voladores no identificados es para algunas voces que se han levantado en los últimos días, precisamente debido a la crisis que prevalece en la República Mexicana y que también afecta a nivel mundial. Pero esperemos que en los próximos días, en las próximas semanas, sean más personas que tengan en su mano una cámara de video para que obtengamos más evidencias en torno a las flotillas ovnis. Mi nombre, Johanan Díaz. Esto, tercer. Next week, God willing. We will continue with this shadow government. Tune in. The shadow government is being exposed. Thank you for listening and may Allah grant you the light of understanding as I greet you in peace. Assalamu alaikum. On February 24, 2013, during his Savior's Day address, the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan introduced Muhammad's economic blueprint to end poverty and want. Seven days times one nickel a day, 35 cents a week. 
Do you have it? Yes, sir. Isn't that painless? Yes, sir. You know you don't like pain. Yes, sir. Look at this. 52 weeks in a year, so that amounts to $18.20 per year. And if everybody in this room, everybody listening by television, everybody under the sound of my voice gave $18.20 a year, multiply that by 16 million in the working force. Now we got $291,200,000 in just one year. $291 million. Look at the power of pennies, nickels, and dimes if all of us did this. Can you see the picture? Look. We want to do exactly as Isaiah the prophet said. They will rebuild the ancient ruins and restore the places long devastated. They will renew the ruined cities that have been devastated for generations. With your support of Muhammad's economic blueprint, we can obtain farmland, build industry, and create jobs for our people. Through pooling our nickels, dimes, and dollars, we can rebuild the wasted cities and provide a future for our children. To support Muhammad's Economic Blueprint, go to economicblueprint.org and register now. Are you in agreement with what we must do to end our poverty and want by accepting a program to put our nickels, dimes, and dollars together and make them work for us as a people? How many of you are in agreement? Would you just raise your hands?